Good evening and welcome to tonight's program hosted by the Commonwealth Club of Silicon Valley. My name is Raj Mathai with NBC Bay Area News. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight and have in conversation tonight uh, with not just a Super Bowl champion and a Pro Bowl football player in the NFL, uh, but a community leader and for many of you in the know, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, and that is Jerry Rice. Jerry is regarded as the best wide receiver, the best player to play in the NFL uh, by many people. He spent the majority of his career with the 49ers, but also had a great run, including a Super Bowl with the Oakland Raiders. Jerry has been a Super Bowl MVP, an NFL MVP, and selected to the Pro Bowl 13 times. In 2006, he was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. In 2010, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And for me personally, it's been interesting growing up here in the Bay Area, I've seen him, like all of you on TV, and just thrilled and mesmerized by the 49ers in the glory days of the 80s and 90s, but also as a sportscaster for NBC, I covered Jerry's career, and then I co-hosted a show with him on NBC. Uh, so I've gotten to know him behind the scenes, and I'll tell you what, he is the genuine real deal, the real article. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jerry Rice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. So let's get, way back. Let's, yeah. let's get the elephant out of the room. Okay. The 49ers dropped nine passes yeah, on, on, I know. on Monday Night Football against the Seahawks. Uh, I was watching that. Can you, can you still suit up? Yeah, I got about 80 catches in me. <laughs> I, can, I can guarantee you guys one thing. No drops. <laughs> I, was, I, I was really frustrated last night, you know, to see so many drops, though. I've asked you this through the years, but now this has got to be really fun for you because the Niners are relevant again, not just in the Bay Area, but across the country, across the world. This is the team a lot of people are talking about. Well, Raj, I said this from day one. I said this team is going to do something special this year. I even told Stephen A. Smith, I said, look, they're going to win the Super Bowl. I just told him that, point blank. <laughs> and, yeah, they're relevant again, and there's an excitement here, and I'm just loving it. When you watch a game, are you in your living room? Are you in your kitchen? Are you screaming? Are you having a mimosa? No, what are you doing I nowadays up, when you watch a game? I am up running routes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing it back, you know, I'm bringing back a lot of memories and all that. But, yeah, you know, I watch the game. I, I still uh, support the players, and I want them to do well. And uh, it's, it's you know it's hard for me though because actually, guys, I played for over 20 years, and I still uh, love the game of football. And I would love to get back on that football field again. You know, it was it was my playground. It was something that I really just love doing and just entertaining you guys. If you guys walked away from that stadium on on that given day and you said, "Wow," We just witnessed something that was special. You know, then I felt like I had done my job. Okay, serious question now. Could you really, if someone said, if Jed York comes to you and says, we need you, how far away could you R be Raj, to Raj, play? Raj, 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 what did I just say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do I have to prove it to you? You want to you wanna race? We can go to that hill in San Carlos right now. Yeah, the infamous me. hill. Let's go do it. <laughs> uh, day in the life now when you're not dreaming about coming back into the NFL. Uh, you're, you're a busy guy. I know you're yeah. very busy. We're going to talk about this new great book that you just wrote, co-wrote here. Uh, but just a day in the life for what you're doing now because I know you're busy. You know what? It's just that I'm working on my brand. Uh, I'm, I'm really trying to stay relevant. Uh, I like to challenge myself. That's why, you know, I wrote a new book. And also, I have an energy drink coming out. And guess what the name of the energy drink is? Goat fuel. Goat fuel. But the greatest of all time is not just for athletes. It's for what you guys do, too, in your profession. You can be the greatest of all time. So I was asked this during the Super Bowl last year. Who's the greatest of all time? And I'm like, OK, I'm sure they want me to say Montana, Tom Brady, all of these guys. I would never say myself. But it was like, OK. And I thought about it. And I, I think I came up with a, you know, a very good answer. 
because, you know, it's like a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, a fireman, you know, there are goats. Exactly. And number 80 in yeah. the NFL. <laughs> Uh, let's get into your wardrobe because that's always important to me. Okay. Uh, it's not important to me. Actually, it's very important to you because I know as a player, you were meticulous. In fact, you ticked off a lot of trainers of the 49ers. You would roll in and they would have to try on all these pants because they had to be perfect. Uh, so now what are you rolling with? And really, you have three Super Bowl rings, but what, what ring are you wearing this now? Is, you can show this us? is my Pro Football Hall of Fame ring, the elite of the elites. Yeah. <laughs> and... I, I feel very fortunate because, you know, I, I, I can wake up and I can look in my safe and I'll say, okay, which one I'm going to wear today? <laughs> which, is, which is pretty cool, you know what I'm saying? But hey, you guys inspired us, you know, to be champions. That, that's the most important thing. And if we lost a playoff game or if we didn't get to the playoffs, it was devastation here in the Bay Area. We all went through it together. And the new generation of guys, now it's a little bit different. You know, they lose a game or they lose a playoff game or a Super Bowl. They just, you know, it goes away. But it was just something I, I could never forget. You know, it would stay with me till the next season. Yeah. It was hard. It was frustrating. There's that phrase, stop and smell the roses. I don't think you ever did for a long time. I, I, I couldn't do that. And, and I had a coach to tell me that. He said, you know what, you need to... You need to smell the roses. You know, you know, I had blinders on, guys. When I was on the football field, I wanted everything to be perfect. The way I ran my routes, the way I caught the football, uh, if I scored a touchdown, I wanted to look uh, professional. Uh, I remember uh, my first season trying to be a little creative. I decided to dance a little bit. <laughs> I looked at myself on film and I said, you, what, you know what, you look so stupid. <laughs> just hand the ball back to the official and, and, and just be a professional. You talk about that drive to succeed, and that's in anything, and now in all of our careers and all of our walks of life. What price did you pay, though? Because that's a steep price. That it's a steep thing that you did. That you, you didn't take a vacation, I don't now, think, what, during your playing years at all. Well, because I, I felt I owed it to you guys to always be at my best when I was on the football field. If you guys paid your hard-earned money, I wanted you, know, you to see something exceptional on that given day. So you have to sacrifice. And, you know, for... First, first five years or something like that, I was just working on my craft. Yeah. I, I wanted to be, well, I, I didn't just want to be one of the greatest football players uh, to play the game. And, and I, you know, it's kind of hard carrying his head around at times. <laughs> <laughs> but U.S. T uh, Today, they voted me in the 100 years Think about this, number one. That's crazy. And I remember, hey, Raj, I remember this. I, I, Dwight Clark, he told me, he said, you know what? You're going to be number one one day. And wow. Yeah. I'm number one. And, and it's interesting because... How I've known you behind the scenes, you are not that guy. You don't no. celebrate. You don't talk about yourself. You always talk about your team. And it's interesting, finally now, it's like, you know what? That, that's where you are in history. That, that's how you're regarded as the greatest of all time. And, and, so. and the second, you know, I got word of that um, announcement and stuff like that, I pointed up to the sky, to Dwight Clark, because I remember when I first came in, guys, this guy took me under his wing. And he knew I was coming in uh, to take a, take a job, even Freddie Solomon. But, you know, it was a tradition for the San Francisco 49ers to pass that torch on. And I remember Dwight working with me, uh, uh, route running, doing what I had to do on the football field. But also I, I would watch him uh, off the football field because you can't just you know, be a professional on the football field, then you, you're someone else off the football field. It's the way you conduct yourself. It's the way you represent uh, the team. And uh, 
and just watching those guys, it was fantastic. That is pretty incredible. Yeah. Let's talk about this book. Uh, so you're heading out at home, and, and Randy Williams, the co-author, yeah, calls he, you up and says, uh, Jerry, let's do a book. And your response is? Yeah, he called me up and said, hey, let's do a book. I told him no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, we just did uh, 50 Years, 50 Moments. That was the bestseller. You know, I'm, I'm good. But then he challenged me. And he said, okay. I, I, I said, okay, let's do it. And that's how we came up with America's uh, game, the NFL at 100. But I feel this book is very educational, and we got great coaches, uh, you know, Vince uh, Lombardi, uh, Johnny Unitas, you know, the integration of blacks uh, into the NFL, uh, the Great Depression, uh, World War II. So it's a very educational book. In fact, I read it, and, and it just feels like it's almost like a textbook, but not in a boring way. But it's almost like you can refer back to this book and learn about the NFL. And in my career, I've, I've known so much about the NFL. I worked for the NFL for five years, and I'm reading this book, and there's so many things that opened my eyes. It was fascinating. I didn't know the early parts of, of, of the NFL, or, or football, not even the NFL. The late 1800s, it was a college game, yeah. and it was so yeah. violent that in the early 1900s, President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, had to step in and say, we're banning football unless you shape up here and make this a safer sport. Those are some fascinating, yeah. that's, it's amazing research in this book. And, and Randy Williams, you know, what he did is it, it, unbelievable because my job is, you know, it's like when you write in a book, yeah, you know, there's going to be some quotes about you and, uh, you know, we're going to have to sit down and talk, but, you know, reaching out to people, uh, you know, getting the info and stuff like that. But, you know, he did a fantastic job, you know, just uh, putting all that together. From the book, we quote, fractured skulls, yeah. necks, internal bleeding led to public outcry to allow the sport. This was in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. I'm looking at that, and now in 2019, there is also some of that in terms of the head injury, well, the public outcry, and the NFL is changing the way. Are they changing enough? I think they are. You know, I think players are more protected now than when I played. Uh, when I played, uh, you know, you had guys, if the ball was not even coming your way, you were being hit on the backside. You know, it was very physical. You had to fight downfield, uh, you know, to, uh, to make plays, also make catches. But that was something that I loved doing. I, and football to me was, is like a gladiator sport. That's, that's what it's all about. When those helmets uh, collided on Monday Night Football, that was it. It was time, it was time to do battle. Now, now it's a little bit different. You know, you, they protect the quarterbacks. Uh, you can't deliver a blow uh, upside the head or anything like that. So. Yeah, I think they're doing a great job. How much did you learn about the game writing this book uh, in terms of, I think back in the day it was three downs, not even four downs. Uh, touchdowns were four points, not six points. I mean, there's a lot of growth here in this yeah, league. Yeah, you know what, but I think I only need, needed just one down. That was it. <laughs> That's all. Hey, you remember Joe, hey, this is what Joe told me. Joe said, look, you added like five more years onto my career. Sure he did. Because sure he Joe did. knew he could uh, drop back three steps, get rid of the ball, uh, and I could go 95 yards or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. You bring up Joe Montana, and around here and around the country, he's so celebrated. Um, we know he was cool in the huddle, but what's something that he did in the huddle that, that just still stands out to you in, in terms of leadership or just something fun he used to do? No, Joe was, Joe was a prankster. I mean, you know, he would put, like, Tiger Bomb and jocks and all that stuff. <laughs> Think about that sensation on the football field. <laughs> so he, he was just that, you know, he was just that, that type of guy, but... His composure and, and, you know, his energy, it was so positive. If we had time on the clock, we knew that we could uh, move the ball downfield and win the football game. That's just like Super Bowl 23 with about three minutes, 10 seconds left in the game, guys. We got the greatest quarterback ever. We just have to execute and, uh, and move the ball downfield and win that Super Bowl. And that was against the Cincinnati Bengals the second time the Niners played the Bengals. And you came down, and, and that was the drive. You marched down the field and won that game. Yeah, but people don't realize, too, during the season, we played them also during the season. And, and uh, we won right at the end with a Hail Mary. 
And I remember Bill Walsh, he was so excited. He was like a little kid. He was skipping off the field. <laughs> Eddie DeBarlow already had went to the locker room. He was, he was ready to chew us out. And, and, and Eddie was that 12th man, and, and he could be really mean, guys. I'm serious. That's a different kind of 12th yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, so he had went to the locker room, and, and I remember Joe threw the ball up, and I went up and attacked the football in midair, and uh, we won that game in the last seconds, and it was just, it was just exciting. You compare now, as, as your career went on, from Joe Montana to Steve Young, you're dealing with two Hall of Fame quarterbacks here. What was the difference, the demeanor on the sidelines and team I meetings? Made, I, made, I made both those guys look good. I could get Steve on the line right now. You know, yeah, call him up. <laughs> call him up. But Steve, Steve had a different, you know, because Steve was a lefty, the spin on the ball, it was different. And also, Steve was a running quarterback. So he was hurting my percentages. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm like, okay, Steve, we gotta have a talk. We gotta have a talk. I need you to stay in the pocket and just throw the ball downfield. That's all you gotta do. <laughs> but you know, he, he uh, eventually he had the highest uh, passer rating. He became more of a pocket passer. So he worked on his craft, and and uh, I think I scored with Steve. Like over 80 touchdowns or more. Yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it was all because of practice, repetition, stuff like that. And, and, and that was something that we did uh, after practice, just getting on the same page. It was important. And it was the same chemistry that I had with Joe. I, I could look at Joe because as a receiver, you got to come to the line of scrimmage. You have to read the defense just like the quarterback. You got to know exactly what's happening on the football field. I know if it's man, I know if it's his zone. If you cover me one on one, there's no way you're going to cover me one on one. You already defeated. <laughs> and I knew that Joe was going to deliver the football or Steve was going to deliver the football. Yeah. So you, they have to identify you're on one on one and you have to identify it and then yeah, you know where you're yeah, going. Yeah, exactly. And if they didn't throw me the ball, I would give them that look. <laughs> <laughs> what's yeah. that look like? That, that? And they knew they had to give me the football. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking, guys. <laughs> uh, let's nerd out a little bit here. What's your favorite play call? What's the call? You know, is it X4 TI slash my, my, the call? My favorite play was uh, uh, 24 Razor. Razor, that means that I'm going to the post. It's man to man. And when I run this route, guys, it's just like doing a dance. I, I, I have done this over and over during practice. I know that the defensive back is, pay, uh, is playing me one-on-one. -on -one. I want to get as close as possible to that defensive back before I go to the post. I want to hear his heartbeat. I want to get that close because I know if I get that close, once I go to the post, he can't recover. So that was something that we always worked on. And your quarterbacks can see it. Yes, yeah, he knows. Joe threw, uh, let me see, because I, I remember a lot of plays. I broke Jim Brown's record, Monday Night Football, at Candlestick Park. The first touchdown, it was a post. Steve Young was the quarterback. You know, during Super Bowl 24, Joe threw me uh, a post, corner post for a touchdown. Hmm. So all of those plays, I, you know, I, I remember those plays just like it was yesterday. In the book, you talk about, your, you write about your routine and how meticulous you were. And that, I know uniform, you that uniform had to be perfect. Yeah. I mean, game day, I feel you have to dress a certain way to play well. Uh, my shoes had to be brand new shoes. I had to have nice white socks. The pants now, Here's the pants. I might go through like maybe four or five pair of pants. You know, with the trainers. They all knew, you know, but they had bets going on. You know, they, you know, <laughs> the trainers got bets going on. <laughs> and uh, it's like I would try on the pants and, and do all that. And uh, then the one that I felt comfortable in, I would go with that one. But I, I just felt you had to look a certain way to play well. And your weight, not 192 pounds, but 190. Well, 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 if, I, well if I was, if, 
if my weight is, if I want it to play at 190, if I go to the stadium early and I'm 192, I'm gonna jump on the bike or the Stairmaster and get down to my weight. My teammates would come to the stadium. They look at me like I'm crazy. Be like, what, what is Jerry doing? He's already sweating. <laughs> but I, it was just something that I, I needed to do. I never could eat on game day. Could never do that. So say there's a Monday Night Football 6 p.m. kickoff back I, in the day. I, I couldn't do it. Uh, the Super Bowl, I couldn't do it. Because I wanted, I wanted to be at my best. I wanted to be hungry. That was important. It, it, everything, everything was important to me because, well, just, just say this. It meant something to me every time I stepped on the football field. I never took it for granted or anything like that. I wanted to win. And, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it, it was tough when we lost. So... So you were doing intermittent fasting before it was such a thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I would go to the stadium. I would just, you know, just work those extra pounds off to get down to my weight. I, I, one of the chapters that stood out to me here, and I think uh, in the book, and just aside from the book, too, is just the race relations and what the NFL has gone through oh, yeah. and, and continues to go through. Um, you came up when there was black quarterbacks intermittently, but really it was... Uh, as the book says, seemingly off limits for decades to have a black quarterback. And really, Doug Williams became that guy to, to shatter it in the early 1980s to win a Super Bowl. Well, yeah, you had black quarterbacks, but they would get converted over to uh, being a receiver or something like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's much better today. Uh, but at that point, if I can jump in here, did that tick you off? Did that upset you? Or was that just kind of the way it was? I think it was just the way it was. I... I was born in Mississippi, guys. You know, there's, there's a lot of racism in Mississippi. And, and, and that was something my parents always told me, like, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. Okay. So I didn't use that as an excuse. You know, when I stepped on the football field and stuff like that, I was going to bring you my best. And that's all I could do. You know, if, if I practice a certain way and I perform a certain way and... Uh, and if, if you, uh, you had something against that, you know, that's your problem. But I was going to leave everything on the field and stuff like that. So I didn't use that, you know, as an excuse or anything. Pretty amazing just to see nowadays. We saw Monday Night Football, Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson. I mean, yeah, this is, I, I wish it, I was it, on the field. I would have hit him. I would have tackled him. <laughs> <laughs> he, can't, he can't be just running around, the, running around the stadium like that, you know? <laughs> Did you guys did you guys see that towards the end? <laughs> He's a good quarterback though. And I I had the opportunity. I was in Arizona. They were getting ready to uh play the Cardinals and Larry Fitzgerald, you know, he uh he just uh surpassed uh, Tony Gonzalez to get into that number two slot. You know, he's right behind me. I know exactly where he's at right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, Believe me, I, you know, yeah, I'm looking over my shoulder just a little <laughs> bit. But, but you, you know, doing warm-ups, and Raj, this is, this is funny because Russell Wilson and, and his uh, receivers, you know, they were out warming up and stuff like that. And I said, hmm, I think I want to catch a ball from Russell Wilson. I'm in a suit, tennis shoes, and I started running routes. And he's looking at me like, how can you still do that? <laughs> 20 years, and I'm talking about, I'm, 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 I'm I, I, full bore. I'm, I'm going. Yeah. And I'm catching the ball, and I'm running to the end zone and stuff like that. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, it, it was a nice moment because we got a chance to connect just a little bit because I wanted, uh, I had always wanted to catch a ball from him, and I think he had always wanted to throw me a football. So it, it was perfect. Well, if, yeah. yeah. If you get what you asked for, you'll be back in the league, so you'll be good. <laughs> uh, just a couple hours ago, actually, uh, I saw that uh, Colin Kaepernick saying that he uh, will have a workout in a few days and all NFL teams are invited. Will NFL teams go to watch? I think it's in workout? Atlanta, right? It's in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, what do you I think? You think a couple else. teams will go, all of them, or, or none of them? I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, you know, I think Colin, Cap, I mean, no, Colin Kaepernick, 
I think he'd been offered a couple jobs as a backup, but he doesn't want to be a backup. And, you know, he did great things here with uh, Jim Harbaugh. But, you know, towards the, uh, the latter part of his career, he started to taper off. So maybe that was that that was what he left, you know, and, and I think, you know, hopefully he can get another opportunity. Let's talk about the business of the NFL and you are all businessmen and businesswomen yeah. that work for the league. And in the Bay Area, around the country, we're talking about relocation of franchises. You are also a very proud member of the Oakland Raiders, yeah. helped lead that team to the Super Bowl. Is it painstaking? Is it break your heart to see the Raiders leave such a great it. community? I, 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 I like hated Oakland? it. You know, what it's going to do to that community. Uh, I think with Las Vegas, they offered so much money, but still, it's like these owners are making so much money, guys. It's crazy. I mean, ticket prices done gone up and everything, and, and I just felt really bad for that, uh, that city. I'm a former Chargers employee. It, it rips my heart out to see the Chargers leave San Diego. And in L.A., no one really cares about them. So, so you've lost there, the there whole are so fan many, base. There are so many teams in L.A. You know, you, you got the Lakers. You got the Clippers. Uh, you got the Rams, Chargers, all of that. And, and it's just going to be empty over there in Oakland, guys, when you think about it. You know, no football. There's not going to be a football team over there. How special was Al Davis? Because he brought you over, and that was a monumental decision for Jerry Rice, the 49ers legend, to cross the bay and go over to Oakland and play for the Raiders. Yeah, I, you know, guys, I, I never wanted to leave San Francisco. I'm going to be honest with you guys. But I still had football in me, and I still loved it. And, and I decided to go to Oakland, and John Gruden, he said, well, well, Jerry, do you want to come to Oakland, uh, you know, and catch like 80 balls or something like that? And I went to Oakland, had a great season, and went back to the Pro Bowl that year. And we had the opportunity also to go to a Super Bowl. It was just unfortunate that John Gruden, Al Davis got rid of him and sent him to Tampa Bay. John Gruden knew everything about uh, – the Oakland Raiders. He knew all. So did, I mean, we yeah. hear about the reports, and I was at the game too. Did, did they know the routes you're running before you ran it? Yeah, pretty much. But but hey, hey, think about this, guys. We had a game plan. We had two of the best running backs. We were gonna pound that football. They they didn't have an answer for that running game, but we didn't know that our starting center would be found in Mexico <laughs> on a in a ditch. Think about this. Okay, you wake up the next day and, and you got all of this going, going on. Uh, now you got the second string uh, center, which he didn't get that many reps during the week. So we had to completely change our game plan. And like I said, John Gruden knew everything about Rich Gannon, yeah. his tendency. And I remember John Lynch, uh, you know, after going back watching the film, it took me a while to go back and watch that film, guys. <laughs> you know, because we lost that Super Bowl. I was so accustomed to winning Super Bowls. But I think by losing that Super Bowl, it taught me more than winning. You know, because now you still have to be a professional. You have to deal with family members. You got to still deal with the media and all that. And I remember after losing that game, I went back to my room and I sat right on the bed and I cried like a baby because I, I wanted to win a Super Bowl for Tim Brown, you know, because Tim and I, we had such a great relationship and uh, we came up short. But still, it just taught me that you still have to have to be a professional, even when, you know, when you don't win. I never knew that. Yeah. Speaking of your accomplishments, you played for Bill Walsh. There's also some amazing coaches out there. Obviously, Vince Lombardi, Bill Belichick, yeah. uh, John Gruden across the bay. What other coach would you have liked to play for that you didn't play for? The history of the NFL, who would you like to play for? Uh, Vince Lombardi. I, I, what would that have felt like uh, to play for him? And, and I, I believe Bill Walsh is one of the greatest coaches ever to uh, coach. 
But he was not only a coach to me, he was like a father to me because he gave me the opportunity to live a dream. And I, I would have ran through a brick wall for that guy because to have the opportunity to come here to San Francisco, like I said, and play for, you know, the greatest fans, uh, the greatest owner, I mean, the legacy, you know, it's just something I'll never forget. Is it hard for the current ownership, and that's the York family, to live up to yeah. what Eddie D did? Because it's almost like an unfair yes. comparison. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's hard for him. It's, it's, it's really difficult because we were all about family. I mean, it was like, it was like live and die together. And in the new generation of guys, I, I don't know if they have the same commitment that we had. The way we practice every day, if you came to a practice, it was like a game situation, guys. I'm, I'm serious. I mean, we ran from, from group to group and stuff like that. If you didn't do your job, you would have a veteran to pull you aside and say, hey, look, we have a tradition here. And if you're not going to, you know, if you're not going to abide by that or you're not going to, uh, you know, work hard, you're not going to be here. I mean, the coaches didn't have to do that. We had the leader. We, we had the leadership, everything intact. Uh, and, and I was not one of those guys that was going to stand up and just rah, rah, rah. You had to lead by example. The way you practice every day. I never took a day where it was like just for granted. I wanted to learn something every day I stepped on that, uh, onto that football field. And I, I think Bill Walsh, he knew that he had the players to do that. Ronnie Lott the same way on the defensive side of the ball? Oh, well, you, you, Ronnie, Ronnie was like, <laughs> <laughs> you remember Ronnie, Ronnie cut his finger off. <laughs> you guys remember that? Yeah. Yes, he did. Ronnie did not, well, well he would have missed like maybe a couple games or something like that. And he said, just cut it off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, he did. <laughs> he did. Yes. Yeah. He just cut it off. And he was right back on the football field. <laughs> but, hey, I'm going to tell you guys something about Ronnie, I mean, Ronnie Lott. When Ronnie Lott hit Icky Woods in Super Bowl XXIII, yep. and Ronnie was the type of, of, of uh, defensive back, there's a certain sound. And when he, uh, so we sitting over there and as an uh, offensive team, you know, we in a huddle and stuff like that, we heard this sound. And someone said, Ronnie just hit Icky Woods. <laughs> After Ronnie hit Icky Woods, he was done. Yeah. No, he didn't want to run the football anymore, but, you know, Ronnie was just that type of player. He still is now. I see him in the community. He's just very intense. He looks at you. Yeah, like, oh I, I just gosh. don't think he could even play now. Run, running would get fined so much. <laughs> <laughs> you, can you see running a lot playing football right now, guys? <laughs> From the audience, which current NFL wide receiver do you feel best mimics your style of play? Uh, Larry Fitzgerald. I, I, I love Larry, his work ethic. Larry uh, invited me up to Minnesota to work with him a couple years back. And his regimen is just, is just is unreal, guys. Same as, like, you know, when I first came here, because Roger Craig turned me on to the infamous hill, about two and a half miles up, then you had to run down the hill and stuff like that. And a lot of the guys came and tried to conquer the hill, and they couldn't do it. So I'm thinking if Raj would, you know, run the hill with me, I would probably have to have the paramedics and everything there just in case. That'd be so. a good story for NBC. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from the audience, who is the greatest unsung hero that you ever played with? 49ers, Raiders, whoever. John Taylor. Yeah. yeah. I mean, John, guys, John Taylor could have went anywhere and really been the guy. Here's a guy that could dunk a basketball with ease, that could do a standing back flip like nothing, then stretch or anything, and just, just could come out, put on that uniform, and just run. John Taylor. So it's like uh, we had great chemistry. If you doubled me, 
uh, he was going to just, you know, he was going to tear you up on, on the opposite side, one-on-one. -on -one. So then you had Brent Jones. So we all complimented each other because, you know, we work together as a team. And that's just like, you know, say the receivers are working together uh, to make blocks downfield, then to open up holes also for the running backs. So we had, we had a team that just worked together as one. It was just like one heartbeat, and that was it. Let's catch up back to the, to, to the present day now. Uh, losing that game to the Seahawks on Monday night, the 49ers, uh, did they learn from that? And how deep will this team go, seriously, here, with the injuries that they're facing? I, I think the most important thing is for them to make corrections right now, to get healthy. Uh, the receivers got to realize that they – they have to catch everything. If the ball touches their hands, you should make the catch. That, that's the bottom line. And, and, and Bill Walsh was that type of coach. How do you, how do you, how do you coach that no, no, right now? No, no. If you dropped a lot of balls, it was no way you were going to be a Niner. He would tell you. He said, you keep dropping balls, you're going to be on that next bus out of here. <laughs> and, you know, there's a new generation of guys that I don't, I don't think guys, uh, coaches can really coach that way anymore. You know, it's just like with uh, John Gruden when he first came back on board. We got, we talking about Chucky. We talking about the little doll, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> with the frown on his face and all of that, you know, but you know, it's a different generation of guys. Now you can't coach them that way, but yeah, you know, they just got to realize that they can't make mistakes like that, but it was okay for them to lose the game. Now they don't have to worry about going undefeated. You see what I'm saying? So now they can refocus. They can iron out the little things and, and just get better. Is a, is a painful loss like that good for the locker room in terms of how you respond? Yeah, yes, without a doubt. Yeah, it brings everything back into perspective. And, and now the guys realize that they're going to have to work a little bit harder and they're going to have to execute better, even on defense. You know, we had opportunities on defense – also, we, you, you need to get to a quarterback like a Russell Wilson and, and cause havoc. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure, you know, they went back and they were very critical on themselves, and that's how you make yourself better. I, and, and, Rush, this was something I always did, guys. I looked at every ball game. If I had a game where I had over 10 catches, 12 catches, over 200-something yards, three touchdowns, I still looked at that game and I was very critical. You know, maybe I, I, I could have been in position to make that block for Roger Craig. You know, or, you know, John, you know, John Taylor or something like that. So that's how you get better, you know. You see now, uh, is there some of that magic back from kind of the candlestick 49er spirit that we finally saw at Levi's? Because it really hasn't been in the six years of Levi's days. I, I think what, you know, what Kyle Shanahan and also John Lynch, what they were trying to do, they were trying to get that, that structure back. Uh, you know, you can tell just being around the facility. You can tell just being around there. You know, there's a, that's the way you have to conduct yourself. Yeah. And, and, and for years, I didn't see that you know, with the San Francisco 49ers. And, uh, you know, this team is having so much fun, guys. Do you guys see the celebration, you know, when they score? We couldn't do that back in the day. <laughs> no, you got a flag or something like that, and, and Bill, Bill was all up in your grill. <laughs> so we couldn't do that back in the day. But now they can, you know, they can celebrate and have a good time and, 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 and do whatever. You know, you guys remember uh, Terrell Owens. <laughs> yeah, with the Sharpie. <laughs> and the popcorn. My thing, how did he know he was going to score? <laughs> he had a Sharpie in, in his sock. <laughs> we saw it. Yeah, he signed the ball. Wow. You, you really got to know that. You got to have confidence, confidence to do that. What would you do now? If you were still playing, you score a touchdown, how would you celebrate? Or would you still do it how you always did? No, I, I would still do it the old way. Just hand the official the ball. And believe me, I scored 208. <laughs> I had many opportunities to do one. <laughs> I would have been all danced out. <laughs> I don't think I've ever asked you this all the years I've known you. How did you guys 
police in the locker room and on the practice field, Deion Sanders, when he came in here. Because he was, he was all about having fun. What, now why do we, we, why do you want to bring Deion's <laughs> name up? No, you know, Deion was like that missing piece that we needed. But uh, Deion brought a lot of baggage with him. <laughs> and, uh, but he came over. Then he realized the standard. How we practice? He was like he. At first, he was, he was like, man. He said, "You guys really practice hard." <laughs> I said, "We do this every day," and it was it was game situation every day, and you know he bought into it and and he became one of uh, uh, one of those uh, shut down corners to us. I had never seen a guy could run so fast. Yeah. I it, it was just amazing and. And, uh, you know, so he worked on his technique, got better, and we were able to go back to the Super Bowl and win it. Nowadays, I know you golf when you're not uh, working and doing public appearances. What else do you do, or is that it, golf? Golf, golf, golf right now. You know, man, that's, it's too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you keep doing it? You got just a little stationary ball right in front of you, and you can't, you can't hit that ball where you want it to go. So it's frustrating to me, you know. You know, as, a, as an as an athlete and someone that have been able to conquer so much, and there's a golf ball right in front of you that you can't <laughs> get it to go where you want it to go. So the the best thing for that when, when something like that happens, Raj, you just don't play as much. <laughs> So, so what do you do? Huh? What do you I, do in I don't, spare time? I, I don't play as much. <laughs> I got a book and I got a new energy drink and <laughs> all of that stuff. So I'm working. I, I have a I have a job. <laughs> the G O A T has a job. <laughs> uh, remind me now of this drink. It says this is not a plug. I actually want to know the name again. It's goat. It's fuel. goat fuel. Okay, hey, guys. Okay. Okay. What's it, yeah, when's it come Listen, out and what's it, it taste like? In about two weeks, and you can go to goatofficial.com. I have, I have four drinks. You have tropical berry. You have uh, blueberry uh, lemonade. <laughs> you got this one called pink candy. Then you got uh, peach pineapple. <laughs> and and, 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 and <laughs> yeah, the thing that's going to separate me from the other drinks, we noticed that these goats in the Himalayas, they were eating these things coming out of the ground, it was mushrooms. Oh. Cordyceps mushrooms. That's it. That's the secret. It's going to give you that high. Now, these aren't magic mushrooms. These are regular yeah, yeah, mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I make sure I got kids at home. No, 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 no. Now, you know, hey, look, I, I played for 20 years. I watched everything that went in my body. This is something that's healthy. Uh, there's, uh, you know, no preser uh, uh, preservatives, uh, zero calories, mm. all of that. So it's good for you. Okay, goat fuel. One last question before we wrap it up, and thanks for everyone's questions, by the way. Well, what, what, you mean, you, what do you mean wrap it up? <laughs> Are we, we done? We got, we, we're a couple more minutes, that's it. You want to yeah. go till midnight? Should we go till midnight? Hey, I'm, I'm at <laughs> <laughs> You... You, you haven't asked me anything about Dancing with the Stars or anything. <laughs> we got, we still got, hey, look, I'm, hey, look, I, I have nowhere to go, okay? No, no. How was oh, Dancing no, no, with no, the I'm, Stars? I'm, you I'm, still I'm watch? Just no, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I can get Jed York on a conference call. We can talk about re-signing you. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Why are you messing with me? <laughs> you know, you know, you're messing with me right now. What a last Cause, question? Because hey, to run back on that football field, guys, for me, <laughs> it would be like a dream come true. I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. And uh, Steve Young, I think it was the Monday night game. What, what what game was that? And we were just throwing the ball around just a little bit, and everything just came back in rhythm. I mean, the toe tap on the sideline. And guys, I don't know why they're making such a big deal out of these guys, you know, being able to uh, do the toe tap. 
and make a catch. We've been doing it the entire time, forever. <laughs> that was something that we did all the time, you know, even during practice and stuff like that. Now, now you see this, this all, you know, get all blown out of proportion and stuff like that. But, yeah, we were throwing the ball around, just having a good time, and it's just like, you know, just like the Kentucky Derby. These horses, they know when it's time to, time to race. <laughs> Monday night, my body knew there was a big game coming up. You just can't turn that off. You just can't do it. Oh, I think she's coming to get us. Yeah. <laughs> yes, here we go. Okay. From the audience. Went to see uh, Katie Sowers, um, uh, the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. How do you feel about female coaches in the NFL? Why not? There, there is an assistant, and will this be a trend? Why not? I don't have a problem with it. I mean, you eventually you might, you know, there are some, uh, I think, female uh, kickers that can really kick the ball. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. From the audience. Hey. Yes. Female president. <laughs> hey, hey, what's wrong with that? Female president. A female president. We'll oh. be voting next year. Yep. From the audience, do you think high-profile athletes have responsibilities to stand up for people of color? Why or why not? I think they have the right to stand up for everybody. I, I, remember, I, I, I remember when Charles Barkley said that, you know, uh, don't look at me as a role model. I, I look at myself, you know, for little kids as a role model. You know, and I have to uh, present myself a certain way and conduct myself a certain way. So, yeah. You got a heart, Jerry. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your time. Is that it? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> two more questions. Okay, two. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, when you talk to these guys, when you're talking to Ronnie or Steve or Roger Craig nowadays, what's the conversation like? Away from all of us, away from the TV cameras, you guys are hanging out, maybe it's at Eddie D's ranch or you're out to dinner somewhere. What, what do you guys talk about now? It's just family. That's what it's all about, man. I mean, you know, being able to, uh, and, and I, I remember my brother Tom, he told me way back in the day, because my, my brother Tom played center for the Jackson State uh, University at Jackson State University and after he didn't get drafted he says it's on you <laughs> to make life better you know for our family and you know as, as a little kid you know going to Mississippi Valley State University and for your brother to tell you something like that and you have all that weight on your shoulders and you still able to you know welcome that you know, and, and it just made me work harder because I wanted to make life better for my family. So that's something that we talk about all the time. And, you know, just putting your kids in a position where they can win and be successful, that's more, more gratifying than anything. Dwight Clark died a year ago, brought you guys all together. Was the silver lining in that, that is that you uh, spent time together? That, that was the most tough, um, well, that was the most tough that was a tough time for me. I mean, because I had watched this guy and Dwight started the dynasty. When he made that catch and, 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 and Dwight used to always, you know, joke around with Joe because, you know, he would tell Joe that they call it the catch, not the throw. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they would go back and forth you know, at each other and stuff like that. And I'm like, Joe, okay, I'm looking at that play and I'm said, Joe threw that ball away. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I would always say this, and, 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 I, and I really don't want to upset anybody because, you know, don't take this the wrong way. <laughs> Dwight went up and made that catch. I said, my God, boy, white guys can jump. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, <laughs> Rod. <laughs> he got up there. He got up there and grabbed that ball, and that was it. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> And I remember, I, you know, I remember watching that, and I was at Mississippi Valley State University and stuff like that. And I, and I never thought I'd get the chance to uh, to play alongside that guy. That's pretty incredible. And it, it was like, man, it was like a dream come true. It, really. <laughs> Eddie D told me actually just a, a, a last year said, you know, with Dwight and Joe, those guys were like so the thickest thieves. They were like husband and they wife. They were roommates yeah. and everything. And he said, can you were... imagine some of the stuff that went on with with those two? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and, you, and also, Dwight would always wear that big fur coat. <laughs> he could pull that off. He was a good-looking guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, so Eddie D says they were like husband and wife. I don't know who was the husband, who was the wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys had a good time. I know you yeah. focused so hard on the practice field. And back then, it was, you know, Redwood City headquarters, then before moving to Santa Clara. Uh, but you focused so much and practiced so hard. Was there a time, though, when you guys had some fun? You know, you, you, you had... You or we whatever. always had fun. We always had fun, but we also, we looked at the big picture. It was all about winning. You know, those two days in Rockland, uh, just getting yourself ready for the upcoming season uh, and being able to show your best quality of football. That, that, that really was, you know, I think that was the motivating factor for us because we always wanted to have a good performance. And, uh, and, you know, it was just something special how we put that together. <laughs> and I mean, God, I mean, some of the plays that you guys witnessed, we had done that like over and over again during practice. Repetition was everything, you know, with the San Francisco 49ers. And I think that's the reason why I feel like we were the team of the 80s. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, sure. you know, we were. One last question. Is there another athlete Hall of Famer from another sport that you're close with and or, or just chat with occasionally? All right. This is <laughs> – I went to uh, Riviera, and I did this thing with uh, Tiger Woods. And when I picked up golf, and I really couldn't hit the golf ball, I was at Stanford, and he was an amateur at Stanford. So he walked up to me. He said, hey, look, why don't you come, you know – you know, play some golf with me. And I'm like, you know, kind of tiger, I can't even hit the ball. You know, I, you know I'm not, I'm not going to torture you that way. And, and, uh, and he walked up to me at, at River Air, and he said, you remember when you turned me down? <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking about Tiger Woods. <laughs> so, you know, like Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, all these guys, you know, it's like, you know, just great guys. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Wayne Gretzky, uh, I had the opportunity also to uh, talk to uh, uh, Pele, and it's, it's like uh, uh, some of the people that that I meet, I'm just at awe. You know, Clint East Eastwood, wow. all his movies and stuff like that. I'm, I'm sitting like a little kid looking up at this guy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna make my day. You know, it's like <laughs> I, I was like I was like, I was like okay. And, you know, it, it, it's fun that, you know, which I never thought I would get the opportunity to meet people like that because I, I never think of myself as being a celebrity or anything like that. But when I met Clint Eastwood, man, God. That was it, huh? That, that, that was it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I started the program by saying, just knowing Jerry behind the scenes, he is so genuine, and when he meets with people, it's not one of those, hi, let me just take a photo, let me shake your hand, and I'm out of here. It's a real genuine love for the community, for the NFL, uh, and really, uh, it's a true treasure for this country. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Rice. Thank, thank you, guys. I, I, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I guess I can leave? Yeah, let me do my... Let me do my official duty here. Thank everyone for coming to the Commonwealth Club in Campbell. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>